indeed worthy to be praised. It's great to be with you again in the house of the Lord as we continue to walk through the book of Matthew. And today we're talking about a very relevant passage, I think. And uh, we're going to be talking about being sheep in a wolf's world. Being sheep in a wolf's world. But before we do, let's pray together one more time. Father, we ask now for grace, the Lord, to be like our master. Lord, it is, um, servant is not greater than his master. It is enough for us to be like our master. And if they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? And so, Lord, I pray that you would teach us how to be sheep in a wolf's world, how to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Lord, we need supernatural wisdom and grace to honor you in these days. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. That's where we'll be. And uh, just wanted to remind you of a famous quote that has been handed down to us from church history, which uh, is attributed to the church father Tertullian, who wrote that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And uh, uh, that's significant because what it tells us is that um, in many seasons of church history, when uh, persecution rose to its uh, highest, uh, that's when uh, it spread <laughs> the most quickly around as people saw the way that Christians were willing to joyfully lay down their lives for the sake of the name. And that makes no sense if this world is all that there is and if Jesus Christ is not Lord. But it makes perfect sense if uh, he is, if he has risen from the dead, and if we too have that hope of resurrection life. And so we're going to see, uh, we're going to see how this works a little more deeply as we talk about being sheep in a wolf's world from Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. And so if you have a Bible and you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. All the way down to verse 25. It says, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak. Or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more would they malign those of his household? The word of God. You may be seated. So I want to see three things from our text this morning. Number one, we want to talk about the courier of the kingdom, the courier of the kingdom. Number two, we want to talk about the cost of the kingdom, the cost of the kingdom. And number three, we want to talk about the call of the kingdom, the call of the kingdom. First, we want to talk about the courier of the kingdom. We are couriers of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Uh, Last time, we talked about how Jesus chose and sent out his 12 apostles as authoritators, proclaimers of the gospel. And so, remember, so in the context here, uh, this is is his discourse, a private discourse to his disciples where he is uh, sending them out and telling them what they can expect as they go out for the sake of the name. Uh, 
they bore witness that the kingdom of, of God has come in Christ and that he is the king. And, uh, and that's clear through both his words and the miraculous authority that Jesus uh, has and that he has given to them. And yet, despite all of these things, many people would still reject their message. And so, the, the major focus of this teaching there in chapter 10, if you, if you go, go back and read it, is the opposition that the followers of Christ will follow, that will experience, the opposition they will experience when they go out for the sake of Christ to proclaim his name. Um, one would think, you know, we would think that the world would gladly submit to the Son of God who is perfectly good and righteous and who rules the world with justice and wisdom and peace, but that's just not the case. Sin so darkens the mind and hardens the heart that it causes the creature to shrug off the Creator. It refuses to let the King of the cosmos, who governs the stars, to rule over their lives. And that's, that's the nature of sin, and that's the nature of the world that we live in. And Christ came not to condemn the world, he said, but to save the world. Nevertheless, there is a day of judgment that is coming. And for we who follow Jesus, he said, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpent, serpents and as innocent as doves. You know... You would so now think about it. It's kind of a strange tactic, right? If you're a king trying to conquer enemy territory, if you will, it doesn't necessarily seem very smart to send out sheep in the midst of wolves. And yet that is Jesus' strategy to accomplish his mission in the world. He's sending us as sheep out into the midst of wolves. Now the reality is, which we can't forget is that as Christians, we have a weapon that is greater than whatever the world can wield against us. And that is that we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. So the gospel is so powerful, for example, that it can take a man like the apostle Paul, who was just bent on murdering Christians and convert him in an instant and make him an ambassador for Christ, the one who was killing Christians, okay? So we have a weapon that is greater than anything that the world can wield against us. In fact, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.5 would say, he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And right before that verse I just quoted, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And so, we have weaponry as Christians, but contra the world, our weaponry is not of the flesh, but it's of the spirit. We have spiritual weaponry. You see, the kingdom of God is opposite the kingdom of the world. Nations conquer by taking lives. Christians conquer by laying theirs down. In the world, those out in the world, most people in the world, regardless of what they say, are pragmatists. The ends justify the means. If I believe that my end is good enough, then I'm willing to lie, deceive, cheat, steal, manipulate, oppress, and even enact violence. If it means that I accomplish my end, which I believe is right, just turn on the news. It's happening all around us. The ends justify the means. The difference is that it won't be so with Christians. Why? Because you can't build the kingdom of God with instruments of unrighteousness. It's impossible. So this is important now. That means that in the struggle for human souls, which is what is taking place today, do not be deceived. The the struggle that is taking place today is not political, it's not racial, it's spiritual. There is a struggle for souls taking place. That's why Paul says we, that's why he said that we, we, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's, that, that is our warfare is that we take thoughts captive and we destroy arguments against the knowledge of Christ because what is taking place today is a battle of ideas, a battle for the heart, for the mind, a battle for the soul. 
But what this, and since we can't build the kingdom of God with instruments of sin, that means humanly speaking, and this is only true humanly speaking, but humanly speaking, we will be at, at, as, at a disadvantage because there are things that we won't be willing to do. The, so, the, the other side, if you want to even call it that, might be willing to lie and cheat and deceive to accomplish their ends. But guess what? We won't. And if that puts us at a disadvantage, so be it. Because that's not the, because we're not trying to build the kingdom of the world. We're trying to build the kingdom of Christ. And that can't happen if we do it by sinful means. Sin cannot beget righteousness, no matter how good the intended end. And so what that means is we are sheep in the midst of wolves. That's what it means. We're sheep in the midst of wolves. So we must be what? We must be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We must be wise. We must be shrewd. This is important. We must know when to speak and we must know when to keep our mouth shut. There's a time for both. There's a time for both. We must discern the difference between sowing seed like we ought to and between when we're just throwing pearls before pigs. Jesus is our motto. If you go and you read the Gospels, I mean, he just, we, we just, we have to learn from him. He was so wise. There were times when he answered people and there were times when he just didn't say anything. There are times when he was direct with his response, and there was times when he was enigmatic and mysterious. Okay? There was times, uh, the Bible says that he, he, didn't, he knew how not to break even a bruised reed, and he, he wouldn't even quench a, a smoldering wick. And yet, he also knew when it was time to turn over tables. And so, we have to learn from Jesus. We have to be wise as serpents while at the same time being innocent as doves. He proved his points without just trying to win an argument. He wielded heaven against earth, and he was crucified for it. And from a human perspective, it was a loss. But from a heavenly perspective, it was the greatest victory that has ever been achieved in all of human history. Why? Why? Because the kingdom of the world, of the heaven, is the opposite of the kingdom of the world. And it is actually by losing our lives that we save it. And it's, it's precisely when the world thinks it's winning that it's actually losing. And this plays out over and over again throughout Christian history and within the Bible. And so we must be wise and we must be innocent. If we fall into the same attitudes and behaviors that the world does, we might build some kind of earthly kingdom, but we won't build Christ's kingdom. It is precisely our innocence, our sincerity, our purity of heart that will set us apart from the world, make us distinct from the world, and give us something to offer the world, right? If we give in to worldly means to fight worldly battles, then we... we then, you know, even if we did win some kind of culture war, we've still lost. If we're, not, if we're building any other kingdom besides Christ's kingdom, right? If salt loses its savor, it's good for nothing. If we lose our savor as Christians, our purity, our innocence, our sincerity, we lose. So let the weapons of our world warfare be spiritual, tearing down strongholds and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of our Christ. We are the couriers of the kingdom, and we must be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So number one, the courier of the kingdom. Number two, the cost of the kingdom. The cost of the kingdom. Verse 17, Jesus said, Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, the father his child, and children 
will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. And so we're we're sheep in the midst of wolves. Jesus says here, beware of men. Beware of men. I take this to mean that we're to never underestimate we're to never underestimate the depravity of the human heart. Never underestimate what a sinful, fallen person is capable of. This is the, this is the contribution that we have as Christians, that we, we actually understand the nature of the human condition. That, that we're worse than we think we are, which is why we need a Savior. Right? Which is, which, you know, we can, we just, we so often tend to point the finger at other people out there, but my goodness, if we looked in the mirror, if, we, if, if, if every person in the world was just judged, not even by God's standards, but just the standards that they held other people to, everybody would be condemned. Because we're hypocrites. The human heart is broken. We should never underestimate the depravity of a human heart. Did you know that most of the guys in the, the Nazi army, if you had met them before the war, were just normal German Guys, like you and me, you know that? If you had sat down with one of them and just talked with them and had a conversation over a cup of coffee, you would think they're a perfectly normal, probably even a decent person. But when the government goes a certain way, when your leader goes a certain way, when the whole push of the culture and society goes a certain way, when the, when the threat of your life goes a certain way and it's going to cost you to stand for what is right, then guess what? Most people, most people will just go with the flow, even if it means becoming complicit in the murder of millions. Why? Beware of men. We are capable of unbelievable things apart from the grace of God. And it takes courage to stand against the grain. It takes courage to stand when it's going to cost you something to do what's right, to stand for Christ. Beware of men. That's what Jesus says, beware of men. He doesn't say be mad about men, be angry at men. He says just beware. Doesn't mean take up arms. It just means know what fallen man in rebellion against Christ is capable of. Be aware. Don't be caught off guard. In other words, don't let this surprise you. Don't act act surprised. I can't believe they did that to me. Jesus said, don't don't ever say that. Jesus said, I told you they would do that to you. Don't be surprised. Don't act surprised when that happens. When they deliver you up to courts, and that's exactly what happened to his disciples, right? They delivered them up to courts. They flogged them in synagogues. They, they were taken before governors and kings of the Gentiles. But notice here, notice here what, is, what Jesus says here. Uh, why was it that they were uh, delivered, dragged before governors and kings? Right there at the end of verse 18, he says, dragged before governors and kings for my sake, for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. So I just want you to notice here, I think this is, is genius, it's brilliant. People are delivering up these Christians, imprisoning them, arresting them, bringing them on trial before Gentiles and governors and rulers and kings. And obviously they do that because they think, you know, they think the Christianity is bad, that Christians are bad, and that, um, and, and, and as an attempt to kind of, you know, squelch the Christians or whatever the Christian purposes are, okay? So they, they, they do that for that end, not realizing that when they have Christians arrested, they are doing what? They are fulfilling the very thing that God intends to do, and that is give Christians the opportunity to proclaim Christ to those who would hold them on trial. <laughs> in other words, even in the very act of the persecution of Christians, God's purpose is being fulfilled. Because now we have opportunity to testify before the most powerful people in the land who Jesus is. And that's what happened in Jesus' day. And that's what's been happening for 2,000 years. And it's happening in the world in various places today. It might happen here. Their purpose was to, pers- was to, you know, to stop Christians. God's purpose is to get his gospel 
It's just like when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, and yet later he would tell his brothers what you meant for evil, God meant for good. You really did do it for evil, but guess what? God really did do it for good. Because Christ is, God is sovereign even over the evil actions of men to still accomplish his purpose. Nothing can thwart God. And so Jesus continues by saying, because that is true, because that is true, then don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to say in that hour. And this is astounding here. He says, because it is not you who will be speaking, but the spirit of your father that is speaking through you. God will take over your lips. It's amazing. God will take over your lips. And he'll say exactly what needs to be said in that moment. All you have to do is just be obedient. Walk in the Lord. Walk by faith. Walk in the Spirit. Don't worry about it because, when, you know, if and when it happens, God's going to say exactly what he wants to be said. Beware of men, but don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. What they mean for evil, God means for good, to be a witness because he has something he wants to say, and he's going to use you to say it. And notice here, Jesus shows, explains some further costs of the kingdom. This is a weighty passage, and it's worth, it's worth considering and thinking about. Brother will deliver brother, the father's child, children, their parents, hated by all for the sake of the name of Christ. This is, this is reality. Jesus said this to his followers. This is normal Christianity. Okay, I, I, just think this, I just think this is important because sometimes, sometimes it's easy, especially in our culture today, if something happens, we just, we're so quick to feel sorry for ourselves. And then when you read the Bible and Jesus is like, what are you talking about? I told you this. I told you this was going to happen when you follow me. What would you expect? That if, they caught, that if they killed me, they wouldn't malign you? This is what, for 2,000 years, people have been losing their family for Christ. For 2,000 years, have been losing their brothers, their parents, their children for Christ. For 2,000 years, it's been happening. It happens today. This is part of following Christ. Because people will demand that you embrace things that you can't embrace if you follow Jesus. And oftentimes those people are the very ones that you love the most. But you can only render your ultimate allegiance to one thing. And it will either be Christ or something else. And there is a cost. There is a cost to following Jesus. It costs Jesus to live in perfect obedience to the Father. It's going to cost us something to live in obedience to Christ. But, Jesus says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. The, the infallible sign that a person truly belongs to God is endurance. I'm a firm believer in the perseverance of the saints. I believe that if God has truly gotten a hold of you, he's never going to let you go. But at the same time, God uses means to accomplish his ends. He uses means to accomplish his ends. And one of the means is giving us these warnings. These warnings so that we will endure to the end. So that we will endure to the end. And there's a call. And, and it is a call. Read the book of Revelation. Over and over it says, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Why? Because it's not always going to be easy. In fact, it's going to get hard. In fact, sometimes it's going to get real hard. To follow Christ. But here is the hope. Here is the certainty. Here is the guarantee. He who endures to the end will be saved. So don't give up. Don't give up. Be canceled by the world if you have to. If it means not being canceled by Christ. Verse 33, we're going to talk about it in uh, next week. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus goes on and say, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. That is, you know, as Christians, we don't have a, we don't have a martyrdom complex. We're all, we're not, we don't go out there trying to get killed. But if it's the Lord's will, will, we're willing. 
We were as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. And then the final thing Jesus says here, which kind of takes us in a whole different direction, and it's really hard to interpret in verse 23, he says, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. And so how are we to make sense of that? It's one of the most difficult passages probably in, probably in the, the Bible to interpret. Because at first blush, it seems like he's saying that the second coming, which we typically think of as the end of the world, would happen before they even proclaim Christ in all of Israel. And then that would basically lead to a direct contradiction in Matthew 24, 14, where Jesus says the gospel will be claimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And so how could they go to the whole world if, uh, if, he, if the Son of Man is coming before they even get to all the towns of Israel? Okay, so I don't presume to have the answer to this question today, but the, I think right now my position is the best case that can be made is that the coming that he were, is referring to in this particular instance in Matthew chapter 10, he's referring to, I believe, the destruction of Jerusalem. I don't have time to make a, the, the full argument, but the main thrust of that is this. And that is that if you go and you read Matthew 24, where Jesus talks about his coming in the greatest detail, in Matthew chapter 24, he puts together the two ideas of the destruction of Jerusalem and his second coming, and he kind of puts them together and almost mixes them together, and it's hard to tell them apart exactly what he's talking about. And the reason I think that happens is because if you read the Old Testament, and, you, and the New Testament for that matter, if you read the Bible, what you'll see is that the coming... The coming of the Lord, or in the Old Testament, was called the day of the Lord that the prophets talked about over and over. And then in the New Testament, it's kind of transferred to the coming of the Son of Man. We, we tend to think about it oftentimes as, as a day of salvation, but the, the major theme in the Bible is that it's a day of judgment. It's a day of judgment. That is the coming of Christ, yes, will be a day of salvation of his people, but the, really the major theme that carries the weight throughout the Bible is that it's a day of salvation of, its, of his people because it's a day of judgment on their enemies, on the enemies of God. And I, I believe that the, the destruction of Jerusalem so it is, a, is a picture, the destruction of Jerusalem was a picture of the, future ju- of the future judgment that would come upon the whole world. And so he's able to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem as a, as a kind of a coming of the Son of Man for judgment that, that foreshadows and anticipates a greater f- and final coming that will come upon the whole world because, because, of, because of the analogy between Israel and, uh, and, the, and the kingdom of God. That is that God chose Israel. He gave the promises to Israel first, and they rejected him over and over and over again. But after a a long season of great patience culminating in Christ, right, the greatest greatest expression of, of God's mercy culminating in Christ, when they still rejected their own Savior, God's patience was up with Israel. And so what happened in 70 A.D.? The Romans came and they destroyed the city, destroyed the temple. It's never been built since. Right? I think in Jesus' mind, that is a coming of the Son of Man. That is a parable. That is a parable. It's a picture of a foreshadowing of what? Of a time of patience. The time of patience went first for Israel. Now, now who's getting a time of patience? The world. The world is getting a time of patience until one day that time of patience will also be up. And then will be the final coming of the Son of Man in judgment. And so I think Jesus can speak about it in both ways. And so I think what he is saying is that you won't get through all the towns of Israel until the coming of the Son of Man, that is, in judgment on the nation of Israel in the destruction of Jerusalem. And so what's the point? What's the point? The point, I believe, is this. We are sheep in a wolf's world, but it won't be the wolf's world forever. God's in charge, so we bear witness knowing that his kingdom can't be thwarted, and we don't lose heart, and we don't give in because Christ is coming. He's coming, and he's going to vindicate his people, and he's going to deliver them ultimately from their enemies. And so we hold fast despite the cost of the kingdom. 
And then finally, we see the courier of the kingdom, the cost of the kingdom. Finally here, briefly here, the call of the kingdom. Jesus says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Again, I think the, 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 this is kind of a nice summary of what he's saying because he, he, he's, just, he's just hitting home this idea. Uh, it, he's preparing their expectations. He's saying, look what they did to me. They're going to do it to you. Beware of men. Be wise as serpents, but be innocent as doves. If they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. He's preparing expectations. It's important in all of life, really, especially in the Christian life, to have proper expectations. And he's, he's giving them, and, he, and, and, he's, and he's really dashing any illusions that they had of self-worth and a sense of entitlement. Remember, the disciples were arguing about who would be greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus says, what's, what's, come on, guys. You want to serve me? You want to be least. You got to be least. If you want to be great in the world, the last thing you want to be is a Christian. (laughs) Because it's not going to happen. Because Jesus was the greatest man who ever lived, and they hated him, and they killed him for it. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more would they malign those of his household? (coughs) Beelzebul is identified with Satan in the New Testament, the prince of demons. And so if they call Jesus that, what will they call us? But we can't miss, too, that in this negative statement, there's a positive thing snuck in there. And that is that we're disciples and we're servants in the household of God. And so in Hebrews chapter 13, we have this call. Verse 12, it says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach we endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. And so we can suffer for Christ, and we will suffer for Christ, and it is our glory and it is our joy to do that. Whatever it'll look like, whatever shape it'll take, it is our glory And it is our joy to do that. Because here we have no lasting city. But we seek the city that is to come. That is our hope. So as I close this morning, I just want to extend this invitation. There are two kingdoms of this world. There's there's the world and there's the kingdom of heaven. And only one's going to last forever. And the invitation of Christ is this. Come over to the kingdom that endures. Bow the knee to King Jesus. Turn from your sins. Believe in him who lived, who died, who rose from the dead, that we might be forgiven and have a lasting city. And you can come over this very day, this very moment, if you would, to the lasting city. If you'll turn from your sins and believe in Jesus, just call on him by faith and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He will hear that cry of faith. He will save you. And you will, you'll join us in the city that is to come. Let's pray.